This morning we're with Council Leader Paul Spooner and we're um, here at the Council Chamber of Guildford Borough Council. The Council have kindly given us permission to film here. Paul, thank you very much for giving us your time this morning. Good morning, Martin. Good morning. When and how did you first get involved in politics? Well, when I was uh, in my early 20s, I um, got involved in the Young Conservatives at that stage. Um, primarily, I suppose, the Maggie Thatcher generation. Um, uh, despite the fact, actually, funny enough, it, had, it caused difficulties for my parents, so that, that for my family it was not necessarily a good news. I thought that Margaret Thatcher had significantly improved this country, and so I did get involved for a while. Um, but it wasn't, I suppose, until around 10 years ago where I started, uh, I guess as many activists do, in getting involved in the local community, asking one or two difficult questions. Um, and then I got a knock on the door from the parish chairman saying, well, uh, Mr Spooner, if you feel that you, uh, um, you, know, you have a say and you want to say, well, join us. And it was at that point, and I've been a member of the Conservatives, I guess, for a very long time, uh, the list of a parish, and then when you after you stood for parish, then you get more involved and you ask to stand for borough. And before I knew it, I was uh, a borough councillor, then on the executive, and uh, then elected as leader. And skipping right to the, the meat of uh, the current subjects, really, what is your vision for Guildford? How do you see it in 10 years' time? Um, a more coherent and successful community, I think, uh, is, is my primary aim. Um, this is a very diverse borough, so we have uh, obviously the semi-urban, urban area across in the west around Ash and Tongham, then we've obviously got the town centre and the market down for, for Surrey and Guildford, and then we've got a lot of villages uh, scattered around, particularly across the east of the borough, so there are different challenges um, in relation to the overall community success there, and so working on each of those areas and trying to improve everyone's uh, in a uh, position in relation to residents and working in the borough. Specifically, um, a framework that enables us to do that. So we've got the corporate plan, and uh, the corporate plan 2018 to 23 is what we're currently working on. And, and I guess the, the 2020 to 25, we'll move that one forward again. And whoever is responsible for this council has something to build on, a framework to build on. So in 10 years' time, people that feel happier in Guildford. I'm absolutely tired of my neighbour in Rushmore telling me uh, that Aldershot is the happiest place you know, to live. And let's get that turned around. 10 years' time, Guildford's the happiest place to live. But I, I was thinking more of a, if you could paint a picture of how it will look. I don't think it will look too different to now. Obviously, we have um, the local plan and the development uh, plan, which will bring significantly more housing, um, retail environment. North Street should be finished. Um, Bedford Wharf should look uh, fantastic from a public realm perspective and, be, uh, and we, we should be in the midst of, uh, of developing that area within 10 years. New Spectrum. Um, so there will be new buildings and new opportunities but fundamentally, we have already a very strong and sound local infrastructure in terms of at least uh, living and working. But what about um, building heights and uh, public spaces? Um, we have, in fact, in this very building at the moment, the draft for the heights and view studies. Um, that will be going through a council process, uh, including public consultation over the course of the next uh, few months. And that will protect the key views. And that will go, I think, a long way to ensuring that those that like to look across and see the cathedral from key positions now will be able to do that, whatever we do in terms of development. But that does also enable us to look very carefully at where we can go higher. And by higher, I don't mean uh, a Woking. I, you know, I mean a, a modest Guildford seven, eight, nine storeys in, in particular areas across the town. Okay. I mean, even seven, eight, nine stories to some people will sound a bit worried. It depends where they are. I mean, I'm not particularly uh, happy about two of the, uh, the larger uh, buildings we have very close to yeah. here. But if they were better designed, then, then perhaps it would be a different story. Okay. But it's going to be bigger in population terms, the borough. And um, uh, that will inevitably uh, cause more traffic 
How is that going to look in 10 years' time? Yes, well, obviously, the key to um, growth, economic growth, but uh, being driven by um, housing or additional numbers, living in our areas, um, requires very good infrastructure. Congestion is an issue. It's an issue in many towns and cities across the UK, and Guildford's definitely no exception. Um, so one of the, the key things that we need to do as we grow Guildford as a borough is also improve the infrastructure. Transport, modal shift, moving to more buses, more easier use of public transport, not less, and uh, also making it... An, uh, you know, I don't think we're going to be adding large new... Um, highways into Guildford in the course of the next decade. So it's trying to ensure that we, we improve the infrastructure in terms of what we currently have. Okay, but it's, it's, it is hard to imagine how that increase in traffic is going to be catered for without major new roads which no one can imagine being built. Uh, it does all depend on this modal shift, but there's no real evidence yet that we're even starting to make that shift. Well, I, I would disagree. Okay. I think there, there is evidence out there. I think the, the fact we've moved forward with the, uh, uh, the movement corridor, the sustainable movement corridor, um, is testament to that. The, the very keen interest there is around cycling here um, locally is fantastic, but of course there isn't cycling infrastructure to make it that particularly safe at the moment, particularly around the town centre. So we have plans within Guildford, but also working with our neighbours. I mentioned Rushmore earlier, working with David Clifford and uh, Rushmore at trying to improve the, uh, the links from that area. Uh, from the other side, Send, Wisley, and trying to prove the, uh, the links for uh, walking, running, and, uh, and cycling. Bus transport is difficult because it's primarily commercial in Guildford, but one would hope that uh, you know, through good planning over the course of the next decade, the companies that are running the buses will see real benefit in adding to that network. That, that I think, is probably one of the key, um, one of the key success stories that I would like to see in a decade. Okay. Is people say, "My goodness, we have actually seen that happen." And don't forget, Martin, also that the whole um, idea of car use may well be changing over the course of the next decade. Uh, one is obvious, which is moving to electric or other forms of, of power. But the other is also, you know, will we be calling up a car rather than having one sat for nine hours to uh, 20 hours of each day in a drive? You know, it's a, so I think that that will also have to come into the planning argument because there's no sense building 10 more multi-storeys and planning for those in 10 or 15 years' time if, in fact, they're not needed because we've changed our whole system of moving around. Okay, but it is a, a dependency, isn't it, for the plan? That, that, that we get this shift and and it, it, there is a question mark about it still so are we are we really sure that the developments won't occur if we haven't got that infrastructure that we need or the, the shift we need you know well, number one I'm an optimist not a pessimist so I always look positively rather than rather than negatively however um, I think we've done all we possibly can do at this particular time without none of us know the way things will move in terms of innovation in a decade. But I think we have tried to protect the, our position now with the local plan, with the caveats, uh, particularly in relation to infrastructure, the conversations that uh, uh, colleagues and I have had with central government, in, uh, and we've reinforced and we continue to reinforce that Guildford will not have all these new houses, even though they are needed, without having the infrastructure we're not in the business of making the current residents of Guildford and those that travel into work in Guildford a lot worse through the, uh, the process. Okay, now you mentioned North Street um, in your vision. Um, I'm interested to know what you, how you see that, how you, you know, the, what it will look like, because you're on record as saying you've had enough of Stalinist developments and I think there'll be a lot of sympathy in the borough for that, for that view. Um, so, uh, is it going to be something that really we can be proud of and that looks good? I hope so. Um, the, you know, we are, we've gone through a transformation in our, ourselves in relation to North Street. We do not own the majority of the land, mm. and therefore it's not in our control, or not in our direct control. 
obviously as being a landowner of some significance, we have a significant influence over, over that project. But M and G and the yeah. majority of the land who own Friary, who, own who the Friary. also own the Friary Centre and Debenhams, mm -hmm. um, the proposal that they put forward several years ago. My predecessor worked well with them. I then took that role uh, forward, working uh, with M and G. They were very keen on a retail scheme. There was lots of comment that it wouldn't work, but they brought in consultants. They demonstrated to us that that's what they wanted to do. We, of course, had resi built in, but we were talking around 400 homes, which many, particularly uh, strong campaigners uh, based in Guildford, thought wasn't enough. Um, and just, I guess, less than one year ago, MNG came to us and said, no, the environment has changed to a point where they're no longer comfortable at board level with pursuing that particular route. And so they then proposed a switch. We were very happy to move to a resi scheme and I suspect that many of the uh, uh, those that are interested and involved in Guildford felt that that was also the right move. And so where we are now is we are waiting on an imminent presentation of uh, from Barclay. Um, to the public or to the council? To the council at this stage. But of course it will have to go through public consultation, and so it should. Um, but initially, Barclay are going to be presenting to us their ideas in relation to that that uh, area. I have to say, it's actually not a large area in planning terms, and so it, it is quite constrained. Um, and that has been a difficulty in terms of viability now for, feels like a generation. Mm -hmm. But certainly, you know, if we look at this, this is the third or fourth iteration. Barclay are confident that they can deliver a scheme. The question for us is, is it a scheme that is acceptable to us in Guildford? But the constraint to the site, won't that force uh, higher develop, you know, in, in terms of number of floors on each building. I mean, you mentioned nine before. Is that what we can imagine for the North Street? I'm guessing here. I do not believe, and you're quite right, you know, the idea of having uh, the Soviet-style um, uh, monolithic blocks is not for Guildford, in my opinion. But if you break up and you have good design, you get architects that actually know what they're doing. If you look at Barclay and what they've done in London, now London is not Guildford, I accept that, but some of the schemes that have been produced are frankly glorious. Now you can do that if you're charging five to 10 million pounds per apartment, I accept that. But what we want to see is the best we can possibly get for Guildford that's still viable for a developer. So will it be nine stories? I cannot say uh, that it will not be in part. What I can say is it definitely will not be in whole. Okay. Now where is actually the mandate for the local plan that's about to be adopted, uh, is expected to be adopted? Um, in particular, the development of uh, Greenbelt land. Where, where, where do you feel that you've, ha you've had the mandate from the people of Guildford that that's what we should do? It's a very good question. In fact, uh, yesterday I was at Creating Communities in London, which uh, creates streets, which is an organisation that spends all of their time looking at that issue in relation to the best possible um, uh, delivery in very difficult circumstances. And certainly achieving our local plan has been extremely difficult personally for the executive, for councillors of my party and all parties. You know, we, we do have direction from central government. We have expectations from central government that haven't changed from the previous uh, um, Labour government and the current Conservative government. But they don't give you the mandate. They give us the mandate in the sense of the expectation in housing requirement and to meet that needs. So where is the support from the lo for locally for this? Well, we, do, uh, we have plenty of support, but the problem is, as I said at the beginning of this interview, we have different areas with very different ideas, but we have to take a borough perspective. For example, we could have done a working. We could have said, well, we can achieve the objectively assessed need. We could have improved the housing requirement by putting up 10, 40-storey buildings in the centre of Guildford. That would have greatly upset the pe people in the centre of Guildford. And indeed, Councillor Reeves, I think, you know, would be the first to be uh, very annoyed uh, alongside my Holy Trinity uh, colleagues. So we try not, uh, we, we took a decision not to follow the woking route. We took the decision that we've got a historic town centre that we needed to protect. We had countryside beyond the Green Belt in Ashentongham, 
the MPPF in 2012 effectively eliminated that protection, which was very unfortunate for the rest of the borough. The majority of the rest of the borough, outside of the main urban Guildford area, is of course Greenbelt. So if we looked at Brownfield, that was available. And remember that when you're producing a local plan, you have to take into account only the land that is available and available or guaranteed effectively, a very, very strong likelihood that it would be available during the plan period. So you have to discount areas that you have no control over where someone, a landowner, is saying they're not absolutely convinced that they wish to do anything over the plan period. Frustrating as it is. One can always take a CPO route, I accept that, but that takes five to ten years. Um, but, but, but Paul, in, in, your, in the election in 2015, your party pledged to protect the Green Belt. What would you say to a voter who says, well, I voted for you thinking that you weren't going to do any development on the Green Belt, and now you are? I made it perfectly clear in 2015, and uh, you'll find if you look back to anything that I said at that time, um, that by protecting the Green Belt did not mean that we would be not developing on any Green Belt. And I still strongly believe that it is a fundamental of this council that we do all we can to protect the Green Belt of Guildford. But the caveat is, from the other side, we also have a housing crisis. We have a housing requirement that is recognised by many organisations and indeed by uh, the opposition uh, parties. And there is the issue of balance. 89% Green Belt. We're dropping that down to around 86% Green Belt. Now, some may say that's a disgrace. But over the course of the next generation, effectively, that means when, when you and I sit together in 10 years' time, or indeed even in 15 years' time, we won't have seen or should not have seen any significant Greenbelt development other than that's in the local plan. So in 15 years' time, we already know where we'll be, which is a very, very green area of Surrey. Nonetheless, there will be people that only saw the headlines on your campaign literature, Greenbelt here to stay, in, in, in Shalford, we vow to protect, I think the word vow was used, and the two councillors that made that vow, according to the headline, then voted against the amendment that had removed the um, Blackwell Farm development that was the one they were vowing to protect. Uh, why should a voter trust the, the Conservative candidates now on this issue? It's a very good question, because I feel very strongly in, in politics that you should not lie. And you should not twist the facts to a point where it's just presented as spin. Now, I do believe, particularly in local politics, that you should be honest. So when I toured the parish councils with um, two of my colleagues, I was asked difficult questions. But I gave honest answers, Martin, because there's no sense in saying to someone, I'm not going to do something. And then three months or three years later, they suddenly find that you have. How does that help anyone? Um, I've consistently stated for, from before I was leader, when I took over the responsibility for the local plan, and through the whole of my, my leadership, and I believe the majority of my colleagues, uh, certainly under my uh, leadership term, have made it perfectly clear that protecting the green belt is key. And indeed, we lobby to central government on that basis. However, we also need to meet the needs of the whole borough. And so my, I would say I'm sorry to someone that was, uh, saw a vow, um, I would say that that was unfortunate. So who was responsible for those headlines? Um, that would have almost certainly been the uh, Conservative Association. So we have four um, associations, doesn't matter which party, you know, every, every uh, um, party has uh, the four associations because of the constituencies. And each of those associations are responsible for the literature that is presented. That does not mean that those that are being presented as potential councillors have no say, because one would hope that they would indeed agree and accept anything that was put forward by the association. But you won't be running things like that this time, will you? No. No. Okay. Um, uh, now, there have already been um, major developments in Ash, your, in your ward area, and more are to be built. Why should your own ward constituents, concerned by the scale of the development, retain faith in you yes. as a ward councillor? Well, I'm a resident as well, yeah. though, of course, and, uh, and also concerned. Again, this goes back to the issue of the local plan. So, from one perspective, there's been a lot of campaigning which has effectively delayed the local plan over the course of the last years. I wouldn't argue that was wrong, because, of course, for different people it's very important. 
However, what the impact and negative impact that's had is that in 2012, the MPPF stripped away the countryside beyond the green belt protection. That meant from 2012 onwards until now, there's been no protection on other than working on within the planning system, um, trying to manage and control that area of the borough. And it's been very difficult. A, a good example would be many times, and I've been criticised for it, I know, um, I've moved refusal for applications in Ash and Tongham, supported by the Ash Residents Association and by Ash Green Residents Association. We have been successful in convincing councillors within planning committee that it's inappropriate, because I genuinely believed it was inappropriate, not necessarily the, de the development per se, but the design and the fact that the community was not being engaged in terms of shaping that, uh, that development in particular. But this has been overturned by a planning inspectorate in Bristol on the, on the grounds that in fact there's no real protection in place, the development um, is a priority under central government uh, direction, and so we've lost out on appeal time after time. What we have been trying to do recently, because we've lost out on infrastructure there as well, which of course the local plan does bring. If you haven't got a local plan in place, uh, an up-to-date local plan, you've got no protection. And that Ash and Tom have probably seen the worst of not having a local plan. Now with the local plan coming in, we're trying to catch up anyway, so that the bridge that's being proposed to try to improve the uh, the transport flow across uh, Ash, for example, will be looking at any possible way of trying to improve the uh, environment and community over there. But we're ha having to do that without having that local plan in place for the majority of the permissions. It's extremely disappointing. But I do believe, and I certainly get plenty of feedback on the streets in Ash and Tongham, that people understand that I did my best and my colleagues uh, uh, did my best. To be fair, again, all parties have expressed the concerns about lack of control over the development in Ash and Tongham. So I don't think this is party political. I think this is an issue, actually, of morality. And, and, and what I'm saying in terms of the local plan going forward perfectly demonstrates the need for it because of the situation we've seen in Ash and Tongham. So you think uh, your, seat, your seat is safe uh, for you personally? I would never say that uh, my seat is safe because that would be uh, inappropriate. Uh, and there may be you know, other choices and there may be people coming forward who make genuine uh, uh, you know, offers that, that are of more interest. But what I would say is that I've done my best. Okay. Um, now, turning to the Solom redevelopment of the station, won't it be a physical manifestation of a woeful centralised uh, planning system created by your party um, that makes any claim for localism risible? Uh, in relation to um, central government uh, um, direction, I know because I met with the housing minister just a few days ago with uh, Councillor Furness that he's looking at that himself. At that particular development? At that particular development to try and understand the background to it. S sorry, who was that? The housing minister? That's Kit Morehouse. Right. Um, so I do believe even, even at the top in relation to politics in the UK, there is concern about the background and reasoning for that decision. If you look at it, pretty much everyone, every resident, the council, all parties, all the activists, um, yeah. the strong pressure groups, yeah. all aligned. Um, a very strong case, in my opinion, was presented. Everyone pretty much accepted development. That was an ideal place for development. No one accepted the design and yeah. style. And yet, we still found ourselves in a position where at appeal, that was allowed. I find that extraordinary. Mm. My, my position hasn't changed. You know, from uh, the first hours when people asked me for a reaction uh, to today, I think it was a terrible mistake. We are where we are. We have not been able to engage with a developer in any meaningful way. Um, I do hope that over a period of time that what we see there is not as bad as perhaps some of us are uh, But aren't expecting. the diggers due in this year? Yes, we, 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 it will happen. I'm sure it will happen. But public realm, the design and master planning for Guildford will have to take account of that. 
So when we come back through in terms of review, we've got to take that into account. It is, it is um, one of the biggest disappointments over my uh, leadership. Sorry, so it is going to happen, but in the future it might not, other things might not, or this particular scheme is going to be reviewed? So no, that scheme will happen. No. I think the, the issue we have here is that Kit Malthouse and colleagues are looking at the direction that, that PINs took. Was the direction okay. clear enough for them, give, given the result? Now, some people have talked about your leadership style, and it has been criticised, not only by those in other parties, but also by some within, and we've had the resignations of some members, one just uh, in the last 48 hours. Do you pay any heed to their criticisms? Yes, of course. Not just to their criticisms, but, uh, but any criticism. I think anyone uh, you know, who is in a position uh, of privilege, really, um, that cl clearly I have, has to listen to everyone. I should say that I get plenty of comments uh, also that I've been far more engaging than, uh, than predecessors. So I think there is a balance there. But I've tried as hard as I possibly can to involve as many people in the process as possible. So, for example, uh, Councillor Roof, who, of course, is now independent, um, he was responsible for the review and the recommendations in terms of governance that we took on board in full. And so the executive advisory boards were brought in primarily, of course, to give councillors who are not on the front bench an opportunity for shaping uh, policy earlier in the process than it being presented typically in overview and scrutiny when it's already happened. And I think that, whilst it's taken some time to bed in, has worked now very well and is now really beginning to, uh, uh, to show that that was a useful exercise. I've always had an open door policy. Um, some people, some councillors choose not to use it. Other councillors use it all the time. For me, that's fine. You know, so the, the opportunity for people to come in and to give ideas I'm on record of saying that good ideas don't come from a party badge, they come from people. And so some of the ideas um, from Labour, or from Lib Dems in particular, from one or two of the uh, Gilbert Greenbelt Guardians, we've taken very seriously as a council. And so I do not believe that we've been deliberately difficult in relation to our, uh, our style. Well, it's not we, it's you. I well, mean... I, hear, I hear sometimes it's the executive, sometimes it's the leadership, sometimes it's the duo, okay. sometimes it's the leader. But, but there's, um, I'm, what I have heard is, you know, that, that it complained that there's a nastiness sometimes some, in some of your tweeted comments, in some of your uh, responses here in the chamber. What do you say about that? No, sometimes it's a directness. Um, that's a fact. You know, I do... Uh, tend to be direct in responses. I tend to be honest where I possibly uh, um, can say something, I usually do. You know, I do not believe in politics of someone just sitting there and saying noted thank you. I think uh, if you talk to five different people across this community on any particular subject, quite often you'll get four different ideas. You can't take all four for, forward most of the time. Sometimes you can. But most of the time, you're having to run a, a direction of choice. And for me, explaining is part of that process and a key part of that process. So explaining why a decision was made. Because if you've got, I don't know, an argument over... Um, Sorry, Paul, but we're talking about the style here. Not, not, uh, I mean, everyone would agree you need to explain why decisions are made. But it's the way you do it and the way you address people. That's, that's what I think the, the, the critics say that you, you need to temper that more, and it needs some, to be moderate. Some critics, Martin, those that uh, perhaps spend all of their time on Guildford Dragon. <laughs> um, uh, but I hear plenty of other comments, you know, that, that are not necessarily aligned to that view. So again, I think it's a question of balance. Do I sometimes feel, after I've tweeted, that perhaps I could have phrased something in a better way, a softer way? Yes, that's true. Would I have actually changed what the fact that I was saying something? Probably not. Okay. Um, now, it was claimed, it has been claimed by some, including your erstwhile friend and ward colleague Stephen Mansbridge, uh, the, previous, the former council leader here, who promoted you onto the uh, executive, uh, that you have ambitions to become an MP. Is that true? I'm not what one would describe as a typical uh, politician or career politician, am I? 
I, if I was a career politician, then I wouldn't be being criticised for uh, making uh, direct statements because I'd be very careful to say very little. So, so I don't know. There are some you can think of, um, Mr. Johnson, for instance, who uh, gets well. Criticism. That's true. Mr. Johnson really gets a lot of criticism as well, of course. Um, you know, for me, my main focus at uh, this point in time is Guildford and the community um, locally. Also, to be fair, regionally. You know, and one thing that people say is, well, he seems to be sitting on lots of boards and getting involved. Uh, yes. I do. I promote Guildford in any way or form I can. And in promoting Guildford, sometimes that also means promoting Surrey. But getting back to the MP, it doesn't sound like a never. It will never be never, but it's certainly not something I'm uh, running to do. OK. Um, right, let's look forward. It's May, the election count is over, and you're back in power, albeit with a reduced majority. The local plan has been adopted. Uh, what will be your, your priorities then for improving our borough? The same as they are now. You know, and I, I believe that if I'm not the leader in May, 70 to 80% of, of what we're currently doing here would be carried over by anyone else taking it forward. So if I'm uh, sitting here, or indeed the Conservative group with another leader you know, is sitting here in May, I think that the corporate plan that we, uh, we are working to will certainly retain probably 100% in place for a good few months, there will then be a look at opportunity for individual ideas and shaping. But most of what we're trying to do in Guildford, I think is, for the benefit of Guildford, would be accepted within the constraints of council by anyone sitting in my seat. OK, but will, will the infrastructure be a priority? Will building out the, the building developments be a priority? Well, obviously the local plan, uh, once it's adopted, becomes a priority. But not a priority in terms of build, 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 which seems to be a concern that's coming from some quarters, but, in sh but shaping the communities and shaping those developments. The shift which has already occurred here is on good design, on making sure recreation infrastructure is in place, as I've long said is needed. Getting the local plan in place is not just a numbers game. You know, it is a community uh, and an improved community game. And for that, we do need to make sure that everything is aligned to, uh, to deliver. OK. And um, would the continued dominance of the Conservative Party in the Borough Council be healthy for Guildford and for local politics? I'm slightly biased, aren't I, in my view there, Martin, but my answer would be, of course, yes. Well, dominance by any one party. Um, I don't think it matters as long as the engagement's there. So if there is a... I, I truly believe that um, having no overall control or a minority position is actually not good for Guildford. So, bizarrely, I suppose, if it wasn't the Conservative-controlled... Uh, council, I'd like it to be a controlled council by another party, rather than, than a mess. You know, because I, I do believe that with control, it's much easier actually to engage across council with all parties than trying to work multi-committee systems and trying to you know, get everyone involved in the decision-making process. Everyone should be involved to a point, but at some stage, decision-making is required. And uh, a majority position enables that. Councillor Paul Spooner, thank you very much for your time.